I will speak about how to approach sequential decision making and also speak a little bit about computational issues now. Huh? Um, I'll prepare, while you were still sleeping, I prepared some slides here. Uh, it's not perfect, I apologize, but um, I think it will give you an idea and uh, there's a lot of literature, but there's not really, you know, there's not like a, a textbook on this topic. Uh, or let's say like this, there are, there are a number of textbooks, for, I can also recommend you, on sequential decision making, but they are not aimed at what we do. They are mostly by computer science, uh, control this type of uh, fields. So I can't to say recommend you an, an, an overall uh, book that you can read on this topic, but I can give you hints on, on different literature that you can read to, to, to deal with this issue. And I'm trying to give you, however, an overview. So to start with, I'll just come back to what we looked at yesterday. You remember this problem from yesterday? We had a uh, technical problem. Yeah? So you want to build the foundation. And before you decide on the foundation, the geotechnical engineer says, OK, we should do a test. Drill a hole. Yeah? Now, we saw yesterday that it was good to do the test, so the, the, the value of information was, 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 was larger than the cost of the test, so we figured out that we should do the test. But now, in principle, in a free world, we, we can do additional things. So what can we do? So we do a test, and we figure that, okay, after the test, let's say we have a certain outcome, uh, the test is maybe saying that there is, might be slight movements, so according to our analysis, we should, we should do the, the, the deep foundation. But we can also do something else. Another test, no? So we are free to do another test. So, because we are still not deterministically sure about the state of the slope, no? remember. No? So if I give evidence on the test, the result, remember that we did yesterday, so can give here, let's say we, we observe a small movement following the test, then the, 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 uh, no, I should also have, now he did, that's what I said yesterday, he has to have a temporal <coughs> order, so let me say, first there's a test, and then, now the, the result will be that we should do, build the deep foundation, but it, we might say, okay, you know, this test was not very conclusive, so why don't we do another test? So we might do another test. And then we might do another test. And another test. We saw yesterday that there is a kind of a maximum value of information that we can get, which is this value of perfect information. So, and I remember, what was it, uh, 140? So and the, cost, the cost of the test is 20, so more than seven tests for sure is not going to be optimal. But we may do more than one test. And in principle, that's straightforward to include here. And to save some time, I have already done that. Uh, here, so, or let's first ask you, so, so if you want to add the second test, what do we have to add in this uh, influence diagram? How do I need to change my influence diagram to add this is the, the second test? In this case, yes. We need an additional decision node. Yes, we need an addition. We need an additional decision node, and so we have a. Let's say this is the first test. There's a test outcome, and then. Second test. So we have a second test. Let's put it here. It's another decision. 
And what are the links going to this? <coughs> hmm? yeah, so we do a decision test here. Hmm? And the links associated with this node are? Yeah, so we know the outcome of the first test when we do the second test. And then we have a link from this to the outcome of the second test. And that has a link here. And then we have also utility. So I can just show it to you. Oops. OK, it's a bit small now. But I can't. OK. Sorry. It's not very smart of me here to do it like this. So you can't hardly read it, I know. Sorry. But you get maybe the idea of the first test. There's a cost associated. There's an outcome to that test. That outcome depends, of course, on the true state of the slope. Then there's a second test, possible test. There's a decision on the test, again, with the cost. And again, with an outcome that is again dependent on this. It's not dependent directly on the first test. So the assumption is that for a given condition, the two tests are independent. Right? Oh. My yes, my B no, not B. You know, so let's assume that <laughs> you take the same team, take the same method, and they drill uh, almost at the same place. There's probably some dependence in the in the, in the performance of the test. No? If you do a completely different test, then probably it's independent. So this is an assumption here that we do. In any case, so here's this assumption, and then we decide. No? Uh, what we realize, okay, what we might. Um, what I should mention is that, and you might wonder, you should have also, you might say that you should, there should be a link from here, from this uh, test decision uh, outcome, sorry, from this test outcome to the final decision. No? There is no link here, although you can make a link if you want, but it's redundant because the influence diagram has this idea of, of, of no forgetting. So every information that you had available at when you made the previous decision, will still will always be with you. So you keep all the information in your head. And this is one of the reasons why in humans are maybe not that bad, in, or how humans deal with this problem in our brains, because we forget. Yes? Uh, it turns out that this not, no forgetting actually makes the problem computationally very difficult. This no forgetting yeah. idea makes the, makes the, the, the computation uh, very demanding. Because you exponentially increase your, your kind of knowledge, and uh, that we'll see later. That that makes the problem exponentially increasing, and in human humans we just forget. Huh? So, so there are algorithms that deal with this problem by actually forgetting stuff. So you mean the information from the first outcome is all the other nodes? Yeah, basically because it was available, we, we knew that when we did this decision, yeah, and we keep it in mind, uh, so we will not forget that. But you could also make a link from here to here to make that explicit if you want. But it doesn't make any sense. No, because the implicit assumption of this influence diagram is that you do not forget. It's the when, then, when, when the two test results would be dependent, then it would be another link. So if you want to uh, say the yeah, they would, you will have to make a link from here to yeah, here. And then, no? and then, and then in, in normal terms, that would weaken the information of the second. Yes. Yeah. No? So the, this common principle. No? So if you have multiple tests, I mean, whether it's sequentially or just in the lab, not sequentially, but if you have correlation among your sample outcomes, there's always a, a loss of information. Uh, that's the general principle. So, okay, so this is how we model it, and, and now what do you think? Should we do a second test, yes or no? So, I mean, it was difficult, but you, you, basically you have the numbers. This assumption is that the, the, the second test will be exactly the same type as the first test. Yeah. But it will be an independent realization. So, um, so the first test was always, we should do this first test. So we think we should do the second test. All right. Just guess. Mm -hmm. First test had a value of information of around 60 at the cost of 20. So 
do you think the second test will be still op optimal? Actually, the, it's, it's a tricky question <laughs> because you can't answer the question. Even if you, even if you run the model, you can't answer the question because it's a sequential decision. Yeah. So in order to make that second decision, you should know the answer to the, the outcome of the first test. Yeah. Otherwise, we are back with what, what Jochen pointed to, no? that we are actually asking the question initially whether we should make one or two tests right away. Yeah. That we could also do. Yeah. We could say, I mean, sequentially, it's maybe a good idea, but, but often it's for, for, for time constraints. Or you, you can't first wait for the first test to decide on the second test. You have to directly order one or two tests with the company. In that case, you don't have a sequential problem, but you have just a problem of deciding directly whether you should do zero, one, or two tests. But the way we do it here is that we, we, we say, no, it, it's more optimal if there's no constraint on time and so on. It's more optimal to wait first for the first test. Then, depending on what that gives us, we might get, we might see that it's optimal to do a second one. So let's run the model and just see what comes out. So, and the decision on the second test, as you see now, depends on the decision on the first test. Well, and it depends on the outcome of the first test. So let's open it and see what's the result. So it tells us. It's a bit hard to read in the back, I know, but uh, so it tells us that if the decision on test one was no test, which doesn't make sense so much, for, but let's assume that we had decided first to, to do no test one, then it tells us that yes, we should do the second test, which is, clear, which is logical because that's like saying the, it's like the initial problem. The initial problem was, okay, should we do a test, yes or no? And this says, if the first test was not yet done, then yes, of course, we should do a second test. Well, the second test would be the, would be the first one in that case. So that's trivial. Now, the interesting thing is here. So if we do the first test, should we do a second test? Well, what, it, what it tells us here is that if the outcome of the first test was slight movement or strong movement, it's optimal not to do a second test. In that case, it doesn't pay off, uh, in, in expected utility, it doesn't pay off to do a second test. On the other hand, because what happens is that even if the second test gives you a different result, you will not actually change the decision anymore. That's what kind of one could see. But if the first test outcome was that there is no movement, it, this tells us, well, then in that case, it's still valid or still optimal to do a second test. Yes? So the second test here is, 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 is the optimal choice in case the first out, test outcome was no movement. Otherwise, it would be better not to do a second test. So that's the sequential nature of this problem. And now we could go on and we could say, okay, now we'll do the third test, the fourth test, until at one point you end up saying, okay, no, it's stopped because it, whatever we do, it doesn't make sense to do an additional test. Yeah? So that's um, the introduction. Yes? Yeah, yeah please. In the, in the case where we don't have the first test. Yes? Right. So, but we go for a test in the second case. Yes. But the value of information should be the same as? In the first round. It is, yes. So this, I mean, this number, I mean, the diff, actually, the value of information is uh, the difference between this and these numbers. And actually, it's exactly the same as we had in the, pri in the, in the original case, yes. No difference. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right, so that's the motivate. Um, I mean, and then we'll come back to this. I just want to point out this. No? So what we can see now is that when I optimize the second test, so this the first test is an optimization problem. Now I optimize the second test. And the optimization of the second test um, requires me to consider, in, well, in theory, I mean, we know that some of these cases are trivial for us, but in, what the genie does is he considers eight different cases no? for the optimization of the second test. It considers 
eight different cases because it has to do it conditional on the first decision and conditional on the outcome of the first test. So it has to run eight optimizations. Now we could consider the third step, the third um, decision. If you would implement that, that would be conditional on decision, the first decision, the first outcome, the second decision, the second outcome. So we would have 2 times 4 times 2 times 4, so that gives us 8 times 8, 64. Is it? Am I correct? 64, you would have to run 64 optimizations to optimize the third decision. I mean, to, to consider all the cases. And it has to actually do that because, what I didn't show now, but of course they thought we have to optimize the first test. No, the first test, what it, what it tells us is that, yes, we should, it's, I mean, we should do the first test. Now these numbers actually slightly changed. These numbers have now changed compared to the prior thing because it accounts for the fact that we can do the second test. So, when it calculates this optimal here, optimum here, it has taken into account the eight possible optimals here. Yeah? If it would have a third decision, it would have to take into account the 64 optimums at the third decision. If I would take into account four, it would have to take into account the, now it gets eight to the power of three. And so the problem that it has to consider increases exponentially with the number of time steps that we consider, or number of sequential steps that we consider. Yeah. And so very fast, this problem becomes, in this crude way that it's doing here, intractable. Yeah. And that's why I want to address also some computational aspects a bit later. Yeah. Now, it's also explain the same problem again with, with, <coughs> with another example. All right. So, start here. Yes, here we go. We have already seen that. Well, you can also think of this as a decision tree, by the way, no? So, the corresponding decision tree will look like this. And there you can kind of see that the number of branches, in this simple example here, the number of branches will increase exponentially with the number of tests that we potentially consider, the number of sequences we consider. And that's the fundamental problem that we face. So I would say that all decision problems are inherently sequential. Now, in some, maybe quite a number of problems, we can ignore the sequential aspect. In other words, you often say, no, in this case, maybe it, it, it's not actually feasible to say, okay, we wait first for the first test result to decide on the second. We should decide from the start on how many tests we're going to do because of time constraints. So the, the, the construction guys are already waiting and they need to know what to do. So we have to decide right away if we do zero, one, two, or three tests. Um, that might be that's a common way to do that. Huh? Sometimes we just simplify it and say, okay, in principle, we should consider this thing sequentially, but the computations are too hard, and we approximate it by ignoring the sequential aspect. We know that this gives us a suboptimal solution, but it's reasonably accurate still. So, so, yeah. so, in, so in that sense, we can often limit the problem to a non-sequential problem. Also the, you know, the, the problems that were shown yesterday by Michael and in his in his lecture and you know, he, this is a central placement problem huh? is a hard enough problem and so to, in itself so 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 because it has to consider multiple <coughs> infinite possible arrangements of sensors in space in principle it's it's also a sequential problem but the sequential problem is, is simplified into just Oh, just huh? into assuming this, this, these costs that you have for, 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 the, for the inspection of, and, and for the, 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 the 
the wrong, the C00, the C01s, and so on. Um, so, in many cases, that makes, you know, that's completely okay. But there are cases, in particular, when we think of making decisions over the lifetime of a structure where we can't completely ignore the sequential nature of the problem. And we have to f approach that. That's this thing here. So, and now I'm going to motivate this with detection planning. So, that's what was my PhD about. And this is not from my PhD, but just to, to, to clarify this, you know, the, this is a problem where we have to somehow consider the sequential nature of the issue. So, the idea is that we want to minimize the, the, the life cycle cost of a system. The system is deteriorating, and to manage deterioration, we can do inspection. Now, inspection, we have to decide on a number of parameters. And uh, I should really accredit my PhD supervisor, uh, Michael Faber, or that's really the points I stole, when I took from him when I started my PhD. He said, okay, we have to figure out when to inspect, where to inspect, what to inspect and how to inspect. And it, also other people have come up with this exactly the same points. No? So when is exactly this, decision, this sequential problem? So should we inspect in year two, in year three, or every five years? Where should we inspect? Here, 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 here. And, and that's also sequential, in, or it could be sequential because in, in, in in an optimal way, we should first do the first inspection, and after the first inspection, we should consider the results of that inspection to say, okay, now we should maybe focus our attention here or here or here. So that's also sequential. What and what should we inspect for? What Michael also pointed out, no, we need to know what we are looking for when we plan the inspection. Uh, we can also plan inspections to look for something unknown or, or not yet thought of. Uh, but that will not be the same, but if, we, if, for example, we know that we have fatigue, potential, potentially fatigue problems, then there is a specific type of inspections we might want to do, and the type of inspections we want to do to figure out whether there is a general problem that we are not yet aware of would be a different one. So we have to know what we are looking for, and then we have to figure out how. Huh? So we could use, again, it was pointed out yesterday, we have different techniques that we can use to do the inspection or the monitoring. So these are the questions we have to answer. And so the sequential problem is really just the first problem. And I just point out these this, this, this questions to say that the sequential problem alone, I tried already to explain, is difficult enough, but then you have these additional things. Now, in real life, typically the what and how is, is more or less answered by in a discrete sense. You have a discrete number of, of possible problems, or type of problems, and they have this discrete number of, of, of possible methods that you can use to inspect. And that's typically also done in a, in a, by expert assessment or also by availability. You might have certain techniques available and others you might not have available, and you have experts that tell you, okay, this is the type of deterioration that we would expect here, and method A and method B are the ones that make most sense to, to, to find this type of, of damage. So that's typically done in a, in a discrete kind of way, a, a priori, but the when and where is really sometimes it's also possible to by experts, but in many cases it's difficult to impossible to find optimal or even near optimal solutions by asking experts. And, and, and what we're trying to achieve is to, to, to solve this problem in a quantitative manner um, but it is a high dimensional problem. Okay. So I'll come back to this. This so far just the motivation. Now I'll first okay, have another ex a last example that I will bring at the end. I will skip it now, for now, and I will go to the, just directly to the computational aspects while you are still awake, and then go back to the last example at the end. So, computational aspects, 
as I said already, can lead to exponential and or polynomial increase. So, of the problem. So it's basically this decision tree. Yeah. And I, well, actually this was taken from uh, Jesus, a student of mine. Um, but it's nothing new. It's the, it's this decision tree. And, and what you see here is, this is the deterioration process, I meaning that, for example, I mean, this is the, the random, the, no, these again are random variables and these are decisions. Right? So it starts out and we have a certain unknown or, 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 or unknown, uh, not unknown, but uncertain uh, development of, of, of progress of deterioration. Think of a fatigue problem. Right? So the fatigue crack, fatigue might, might, might or might not grow in the, in the different dimensions. And that's, if you think back of the structure, it's not only at one place, but might be at many different places in the structure. Many structures we're looking at are quite big. So that's why I was saying polynomial increase with system size. It's larger the system, the, the, the more states I have here. Then, okay, then there is a system condition. And here we just assume the system either works or not. I mean, for structures, well, in most cases, we can simplify it and say, okay, the, the function of a structure is to, to support what the activity, I mean, to support, uh, to stand there, no? to, to, to support the load. Either it fails or it doesn't. Might have serviceability limit states, but we can say, okay, the structure, the complete structure either works or, the, or, or doesn't. And for offshore structure, that's very much the case. No? So either they, this, they are called support structures. No? So either they stand there and they, they are they're okay, or they, co they collapse. So when they, Okay, one here means actually failure. It's a bit misleading. So one is a failure. If, if, the, if the structure fails, we can stop the analysis because that's it. But, but in, of course, we, we expect the structure not to fail. And then we have to decide after some time whether we should do inspection. And then again, the inspection outcomes. No, sorry. This is always one behind. I don't know. So basically, here. Uh, so here is the decision on the inspection. And we can decide not to inspect at all, or we can decide to inspect, and then we can decide inspect here, 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 or here, here, here. Yeah. So the number of inspections, but not only the numbers, but also the locations, yeah, because they are not all the same components. No? So, so some are more loaded by fatigue, but other components are more critical. So the, you know, it's, this, is a, this is in itself is just an enormous problem just to solve this, but you have, you have almost infinite possible options here. Then you have outcomes. Again, they're random. And then you have the, the decision on the repairs. We, that often we simplify and we just say, okay, whenever we, we find something, we fix it. But in principle, that's also a decision. And then you have the condition of the system, so the deterioration goes on potentially and, and it evolves. And you have again a possible failure or not. And then this whole cycle repeats. And, and, and you can imagine, no, this, this is an exponential increase in the problem size. And if you would like to plot all the branches, compute all the probabilities, you complete, you're very quickly out of computation. So that's not possible to do, even for a small system. You know? So that doesn't work. So what are the options? And, well, okay, there's, the, I mean, the, what I've seen, and I've worked a bit in this field, no? so, um, they actually only, I uh, found only, that, Really, two. As I said, you can also try to be with, with experts. You can do. I mean, there's other things you can do. But from, like I say, computational uh, approaches to solve this particular problem, I would say one is based on partially observable Markovian decision processes and related concepts. There are some other concepts that are related to that. Um, and then what I most, or what I'm kind of advocating is. Um, what we call direct policy search, or a heuristic approach. And I'll explain both these concepts a bit quickly. So, Markov decision process, an example. Okay, that was, as I said, this morning. The example is missing. It's because of you, Raki. So, I... <laughs> but, what is it? I will make an, you can make an example here. It's not very difficult to make an example. So. Um, so, for example, the decision problem of going home after the <coughs> after the dinner. Huh? So, this is 
let's say like this. So here is, here is uh, how do I feel? Uh, how do I feel? How do I feel? Failure? No, not uh, anyway, F. This is how I feel at time t. And um, and uh, then this this will make uh, will, will inform a decision on whether I should have another uh, Raki or not at time t, or whether I should go home. So if I go home, I'm uh, kind of finished here. But and then you this decision will then will then uh, translate into how I feel in the next time step. And then again, I have to decide, do I go home now or not? So do I drink my Raki or should I go home? <laughs> and that's actually, that's utility. Yeah? So uh, both positive and negative associated with that. Um, with the, the utility is associated with how I, I mean, the Raki is for free because you pay for it. but. Uh, so I don't have the utility for that, but uh, I, f I have a utility for how I feel. No? So I have a certain way of, so also how I feel the next morning. So uh, I feel perfect, by the way. So it's okay. Anyway, so this is a whatever. So this is a, and then this is related. So, so if I already feel bad here, I will feel even worse here, and, and so on. So this is a. So this is a sequential decision problem. At every point in time, I said, okay, another one, another one, eventually I go home. And, and in a way, if you are experienced, see our students, so you have experience, no? So you, at some point, you know that, okay, what you decide, I mean, what, what, when you decide here, you should also already think three, step, three time steps ahead. Because you say, okay, if I drink this uh, second drug E, I will, get into a good spirit, and I will drink the third one, and I will drink the fourth one, and then the fifth one, and then I will regret. But I, because the, so, so, so it's not that I can only think of the next time step, but I have to think already three or four time steps ahead when I do this decision. And I mean, when you translate this to, to, a, to our type of problems that we are supposed to deal with, then this would translate to, for example, you know, when you, you can say uh, you have, uh, think of operating a water pipe. No? This is the condition of the, 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 the pipes in the, the, the system. And at each point in time, you can decide to do some maintenance actions. Yes. Those will affect the condition at the next time step, of course. No? At which point, you can still, we can again decide on whether we should do maintenance action. The assumption is that when I do the decision, I know the state of the system. Yes? So I know my own feeling. Uh, and in the, in the water pipe system, the assumption is that I know how many leaks there are in the, in the, at each point in time, which probably is possible because you can measure how much water you lose. So, so this is a Markovian decision process, which means once I fix here, the, this, this, this node here, so I fix this. This is decoupled from this. Huh? That's these Markovian properties that we saw in the, in the Bayesian network. In, in the, in the Markov, so this is a Markov process here, and then the decision process is also Markovian, because once I know this, whatever happened in the past will no longer affect the future and vice versa. This is the Markovian decision process. And the advantage of this, is a strong advantage of this, is that I can break this, this kind of, kind of uh, curse of, of dimensionality or, or, or this, this, ex, this uh, exponential ex increase with, with uh, sequences. Because how do I solve such a problem? Well, there are two. Okay, there's, there are finite and infinite dimension, um, time processes. So if you have an infinite dimensional process, there's, just, I'm not going to discuss this, but there are even easier solutions. But we typically deal with finite time horizon problems. So we have a 50 year service life or 100 year service life. So we solve the problem by starting, so now, Assume that this is my last possible time step because here is when your money runs out for, for Raki. So that 
cannot get more than, than, than to here. This is my last, this is the last uh, time step. So this is my last, this is my last decision. There are many decisions before that, but this one is my last decision. So I, what I'm doing is, I'm fixing this, and I'm saying, okay, here I might feel terrible, bad, good, or euphoric. And for any of those four states, I'm making an opti I'm trying to, I'm saying, okay, given that I feel terrible, what is the optimal decision? Given that I feel euphoric, what is the optimal decision? So I'm going to optimize just this decision, conditional on this, and because when I fix this, it doesn't matter what happened here, that's independent, so I can optimize this just by, for these four different cases. Conditional on these four different cases, not conditional on the whole history and so on. Then I have this optimal solution. Then I go to the next time step, and I'm, trying to, and I'm going to optimize this conditional on, on how I feel here. And now, the good thing is, I have already solved the optimal problem here. I know the optimal decision here for given each of those four states. That means that each of those four states is associated with an expected utility that is already taking into account that the optimal decision is taken here. So, and, 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 and continue, continue like this, that gives just a linear, so the computation time just increases linear with number of sequences. And it's, this state here is not very big, there's no problem. Yeah? And guess what? This is exactly the Bellman's equation that was pointed out yesterday yeah? in the optimal control. Yeah? So well, the basis, at least for this, I mean, then there have been a lot of developments, but uh, this, this basic idea is exactly this. Nothing else. Linear programming. So that's, if you have a problem like this, it's not much of a problem. However, that's very rarely the case. Why? Because in, in most real problems, we do not observe the state exactly. Yeah. So we do not know exactly what is the condition. If you have a perfect health monitoring, you would know. But that's typically not the case. As we saw yesterday, we have a likelihood function that describes, that gives us information that is indirect, that we can use to update, but we will not, um, exactly know what happens. So, this is what, so we get to a partially observable Markovian decision process. And unfortunately, this is, a, this is an example. I should have made this, I should have show, shown a simpler one. Uh, so this is already a bit complicated here. But what, you, what, what we see is this, okay, here's the condition of the, the system. The idea is that, okay, at time one we can make a measurement. This is the measurement set, which we have to decide on whether we do it or not. So this is the, that's why it's a decision note here on, the, on whether we should do a measurement. And then based on the measurement, we have a new condition. Behind that is a, is a decision on repair. We have, avoid, we have skipped this decision on repair here because we say whenever there is a problem, we fix it. When there's no problem, we do nothing. So the decision has already been taken and it's not shown here. So, Anyway, so this is one, and then you have some costs here, and then system state. So, but the main idea is this. This is the state, the condition, and these are the observations. They are not uh, here, but they are here. Which means that even if I know, if I observe this, I don't know this with certainty. So, I never have deterministic knowledge about this. And this solution is not applicable. Because when I, the, the past, so given this knowledge, the past does not become independent of the future. So given this, I can't just condition on this and say, okay, I can just consider the future. So it doesn't work, and in principle, I would have to, now I would have to solve, again, the exponentially increasing problem. That's not convenient. So what is done is, so this actually, here's a simple example. I should have shown this, sorry from a master physics recently. So, but it's the same thing. No? So this is the condition, and here is the, the observation. And the observation is then used to do actions um, that affect the, that affect the, the, the consequence. So 
what do we do instead is something is called a belief state is introduced. Um, this is the main idea of or the genius idea of the partially observable Markovian decision processes. These are things that also came up in, I don't know, 70s or 80s. Um, and then I think in the 90s, first people started to use it for, for planning inspections. So that was, I think, around 90s. And in recent years, there has been um, an increasing amount of people trying, or, or not trying, uh, 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 using those concepts to solve inspection planning problems. Because the algorithms that do that have increased quite tremendously. The main idea is that we solve the problem now by introducing this belief state. What does it mean? So instead of, instead of uh, conditioning on, on theta, like we do here, which is not possible because we, it's not, we, we condition on a kind of a combination of theta and the observation. This is the belief state. So, so the, the, the idea is we, in, instead of saying that the system is in state good or, or, or at this time or bad, we say we condition on what we believe about the state. So for example, we could have, we have just two states, bad or good. Then our belief state is described by the probability of the system being bad or good. I mean, this is one minus, so. So, this, so, this, so we, let's say we have a probability from zero to one of that we, at this point in time, believe the system is in a good state. This is based, and, and, and the belief that we have comes from the, the combination of the prior and the, the update, the, the observation. So we do Bayesian updating, and we get a posterior distribution. And in the simplest case, where we just have two states, this means we have a distribution over P, the probability of being in a bad state, from zero to one. A beta distribution would be appropriate for that. Huh? So a beta distribution, and that beta distribution represents my belief state at point in time one. And then, in point in time two, I, mean, I, I, observe, I observe, then I have a, a, a new belief in point in time two, so now I believe that the probability of being in, 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 a, in, a, good, in a good state is 0 0.9, based on what I have observed. And what, and, and what turns out is that if we, con if, we have, if we fix this belief state, which includes both of those, then we have again a Markovian decision process. Just not in terms of the original problem, but now in terms of this belief state B. And then we can go back and use the solution to the Markovian decision problem. Yeah. So that's in a, in a nutshell. Of course, if you, it takes a bit more time and, and, and it takes or some, quite some time to understand and implement all these things, but that's the main basic concept of, of this COMDP. What is the, the downside? Well, this belief state can become very large. So if my state here is binary, 0, 1, the belief state becomes a continuous random variable from 0 to 1, which I have to discretize then. If this is a continuous random variable, my belief state becomes already infinite dimensional in principle. Now there are special cases where, the belief, where I can, you know, assuming normal normality and so on, I can, well, if, the, if this process is a Gaussian, linear Gaussian process, then the distribution, posterior distribution at every point in time is described by a Gaussian distribution. The Gaussian distribution has two parameters, mu and sigma. So the belief state requires to represent a distribution over mu and sigma. So in that case, that's still doable. But then there's a linear Gaussian processes are uh, a field where this would be is quite easily applicable. Actually, that's what my student here used uh, in her analysis. Um, but then, when you can do general cases, this might not be just a random variable, as we saw before. In, in our problems that we have, this can be hundreds or thousands of random variables. So, and then thousands of random variables, and then the belief state is obviously going to be, I mean, in incredibly large. Um, so until recently, there was not much we could do to apply this to more, more realistic problems. We had to just make these simple assumptions, normality, and so on. 
Now, more recently, in computer science, and uh, I mean, this, this reinforcement learning and all these communities, they have, I mean, they are very much interested in this. This is not just a problem for us. This is general to solve planning problems in very general, broad uh, areas. So they have come up with, with, with very powerful um, algorithms, I won't go into the details, that again are, are, are approximation to the solutions, but they can deal with high dimensional problems, higher dimensional problems. So that is something you can explore. Um, I, yes, just, uh, please interrupt. Yeah. So, so, so you, you summarize these two no nodes in a belief state, right? Yes. Uh, that I understand. But then, then the information only comes on set one. So you, yes. still, you still have a, uh, a big, uh, or a big, a big uh, collection of possibilities. So you have to, so in order to make the to use this Markovian property, yes. that the network is getting independent. So how, how yes. Well, I mean, basically, you have to think that, okay, so, that, so now this thing here, then it looks like this, B1, with my B is my belief state now, yes. B2, yeah, yeah, and so on. And now what you're pointing out is that, okay, then I have my A's and so on. So, I have basically my, so basically what I do is I do this, I'll just, um, to, just, I think it's helpful to show this, uh, to, to answer that question. Is a, no, this, okay, this case doesn't look like, okay. Sorry, there's no arrow here in this example. The arrow goes to the, okay. But in any case, so, so basically I do a reduced, a reduced, and I'm skipping the utility nodes here, but there are the utility nodes. I'm doing a reduced thing that then looks like this. No? Um, and you're right, I mean, of course, I still have to consider the, the, that there is actually a theta on the set. Right? And that can be uh, well, it's higher dimensional. But the first step that is done is actually to, 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 a, to establish this network here. And to establish this network, you need to just apply a base rule, more or less. Considering, and, and you have to, and, you, and the thing is you can do that locally. So you can just take, uh, you, you, you take, uh, first you take um, B1 and B1 would then be um, the posterior, you basically take the, the, the posterior distribution of, of the, in this case of the two random, of the binary case, no? you would take the posterior distribution of this P. And then here you have to take B2 given B1 and, and uh, given this decision. So that means that you, you have to say, okay, this is now your prior. Yeah? And if this is your prior, uh, you have to think of all the possible observations you can make here, and you do a, a Bayesian, again, a Bayesian updating here to get this, this conditional on this. So if I would believe that my probability, if my belief that the probability initially is uh, 0 0.05, then there's a certain probably a prior, a posterior distribution that I will get here. Yeah? I mean, yeah, I'm, it, I mean, as I said, it's actually I'm trying to explain it fast and, 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 and simple. But, but you, you actually pre-process this and, and you do basically just a, a, a number of Bayesian analyses here to, 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 to construct this, what you believe here, condition, or what is the distribution of what you might believe here given what you believe here. And, and this you can do by a sequence of... Uh, yes, but I mean, in, then this, I mean, these high-dimensional problems then are solved uh, again with exactly sampling or different techniques, including sampling techniques and so on. So I cannot go into this. There is software is available. Actually, yeah, the next slide here. So I think the guy, the guy who knows most about this in our field, not in general, but in, in our field, is uh, here Costas, Con um, Papa Constantino. So he's in. Uh, Pennsylvania. So, if you have, he, and he wrote a number of papers on this, um, and he really is, I think, the guy who really knows this stuff. He also, there's also a paper, I think it's, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if it's this paper, but he has also a paper, I remember, where he diff compares different software solutions that are available. That, they all come from the field of, as I said, computer science and so on, so they're not made targeted to what we do. And often the, the problems that we have, I mean, they all have limitations. And the problems that we have might not always fit within those limitations. You know? so, 
it's a bit tricky. I had some students try, uh, trying out also some things, but I realized that in Munich a master thesis is six months long. In six months, was I mean, smart students could implement problems, but simple problems. Complicated problems, you can't implement just in, in, in a few months here, I mean, even if you have the software. So this is something that is interesting to explore, but if you go down this path, you should maybe first think how you do it. Just Don't just say, okay, this looks like a cool thing, and then trying it out, okay, try it out for a week or two, but before you spend one year of your PhD about on this, we speak with uh, this guy. All right, that summarizes this. Any or questions that you might have on, on, on this type of techniques? Yeah, so, so I spoke with Costas. Okay. I'm one of these crazy guys. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Very good. So the problem comes when, so you have the transition matrix, which is like when you go from one condition to another condition. But if this is changing over time, yeah. Yes. That, that's yeah, that's, uh, so if you have a non-stationary, yeah process basically or non-homogeneous process that's one of the issues yes <laughs> so okay so, so you can also speak with this guy yeah. <laughs> that's good yes yeah. anyway so this is uh, okay this is one approach I'm going to show you a second approach this is what I mean we have, said, we have been using this a little bit on simple problems because we have another approach, and to compare our approach to this, we, 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 we have applied the, this a bit on, on, on simple problems, but not on, not on the big problems. Uh, and this is what we call the heuristic approach, or, or the, in, in the more computation, in the more general computer science community, maybe it's known as direct policy search. Um, and I start with an example from my thesis, from my PhD. Thesis, or this is not exactly from PhD thesis, but this is something we have done. We have done in my PhD thesis. Uh, some people yesterday mentioned that they have read this. Very good. Uh, so sometimes people read actually those things that you do. It seems uh, if you are lucky. Um, anyway, so so what is the idea? So so this is a, um, a reduced problem. Here we try, or I try, just to to calculate. What is the optimal time of inspection? So we assume we have one component, not a system, not a system just a component. That component deteriorates, similar to the type of problem we consider with Jochen. So if, and we have, uh, we now uh, can do inspections at, at, at any point in time. And based on the inspections, we decide to repair or, or, or not to repair. And the question is simply, when should we do inspections? So just the when problem is answered here. Fixed, everything else is fixed. Now, but still, it's an exponentially increasing problem, difficult to solve. So the, the very simple heuristics that we use, and it's not my idea, these heuristics I should mention. Eh? Again, uh, this was something that was given to me by my supervisor at, in my PhD, and was done by, by, by him and others before. So the, the simple idea was to say, OK, we, we, we calculate at every point in time the probability of failure of my component, and whenever that exceeds a certain threshold, we'll do an inspection. And this seems reasonable from an engineering point of view. You know? Whenever you, your, your reliability is decreasing below a certain limit, you, you do an inspection. And then, you, then we just vary the, this threshold. And the times of inspection directly follow from this threshold. So if I have a threshold that is lower, I get more inspections, if I put my threshold higher, I'll get fewer inspections. And I, instead of having to, to, to decide every point in time whether I do an inspection or not, I just have a single parameter that completely determines my inspection strategy. So that's one option. Second option here that, we, that I considered also in my thesis was to say, okay, no, instead of more practical from, a, from, from an operational point of view is to fix the time intervals between inspections. So instead of, so we, we just say, okay, we do every inspection every five years or every 10 years. And then instead of, so instead of fixing the threshold, we fix the, the intervals between inspections. That's the second type of heuristic rule. 
<laughs> and again, you see, it's just one parameter. The time between inspection, that's even discrete, if you, pref if you prefer discrete optimization. So um, I can reduce the big problem to a simple problem. What happens then is that once I do that, once I fix that, this whole decision tree, this large decision tree, actually turns into a, an, what I call a, it's an event tree. Because there is no more decisions are made for a fixed. So I fix my parameter. I say I inspect every five years. And when I fix that, there is no more decision to be made. It's just an event tree. The event tree will, the simplest event tree looks like this. I have a failure or survival up to the first inspection. So the component might fail or not. This is the probability of failure. At the first inspection, I can have different outcomes. But ultimately, I'm interested whether I'm going to repair or not. And that's, OK, there's a lot of decision here. But that decision, again, is fixed. So we fix and we say, every time we find something, we, we repair. So this is the second decision rule that I kind of suppressed. So this, the, the first heuristic, we expect every delta t years. Secondly, every defect that is found is inspected, or every defect above a certain threshold is, is, is fixed. OK, so I have a certain probability of finding something larger than that. In that case, I repair. And here, the simple idea is that, OK, once I repair, I'm going back to 0, 0.0. But you can also do a different model there. It's not so important. And or if I don't repair, if I, don't, or if I find something lower, I won't repair, and I continue. Can have failure or a survival. Again, so this is still this can have many, many potentially infinite. And in the problems that we're looking at, they can get to infinite number of branches. And this problem is still a limited number, but in, in general, infinite number of branches. However, because there's no decision here, I could just if in the, in, I could just use crude Monte Carlo to solve this. If the probability of failure is small then it's not going to be optimal. I'm going to show an alternative approach. But, but since there's no decision here, there's no optimization more anymore involved. The optimization is taken outside of the tree. The sequential problem is, is replaced by a kind of just deciding on, on, on a set of, of parameters defining my heuristic. I can, I can solve, I can calculate the expected cost associated with this particular strategy. And then, this is what we do. So we, and then, and then we just vary the different. I can use this. Actually. We just vary the different uh, things, and so we. And actually, this is. I'm not even sure. I think it's not from. Uh, I think that this is not from us. I should have put the references. Sorry. Yeah, this yeah. is from Jenny Nielsen. No? Yes. Okay. This I think is from Jesus. This is from us. That's okay. But this I stole. So yeah, I. I'll try to remember to put the reference before I upload this slide. So this is from uh, Jenny Nielsen, so from Alborg. So I guess some people are from Alborg here. So she, you might you probably know her. Uh, so she's also somebody who knows a lot about PomDP. I guess less than Gostas, but still a lot. So if you are in, in Alborg, you can ask and speak with Jenny. So she compared this uh, PomDP approach with um, this idea of the, the probability of threshold approach. And to, to compare, what is the total, what is the optimality of the strategy? Now, the PomDP in principle should give the optimal strategy. The reason, and, and the fact that this, this, this threshold approach that I showed here gives a lower total expected cost shows that there is a, you know, that the PomDP solver has actually not found the optimal solution. Because if we solve the, the full problem, the PomDP problem, in principle, we should be optimal. But it's, uh, in, 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 yeah. Anyway, so, but if you see here also that the, the difference, this is the total expected cost from the optimal strategies are very similar, even though the, the, the distribution of costs is rather different. So the probability of failure, so it, from the P accepts higher risk and, 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 gives, and, and gives lower, lower inspection cost, whereas, no higher, not the opposite. The higher inspection cost and, uh, low, and uh, lower repair cost, whereas the, the threshold approach gives higher Repair costs and lower inspection costs. But the total cost is the same. And this is the comparison of Jesus, where he also compared the PomDP, which is the limit, which is another version, but you can think of it like a PomDP solution. Um, it's a, and you see it again, 
the, this is the, the, the uh, solution we get from periodic inspections. So we just assume every, maybe 15 is every two years, every one year, uh, with every three years, every four years. So we, we, we just assume that we have a certain number of inspections distributed over the lifetime at equal in intervals. And this is the, the number of inspections. And what we see is that the optimum is very similar. And this is also because it's very flat. You know? The, the, the optimum is very flat. So if you do a few, if you do, a, if you are a bit off, it doesn't really matter. So there are a number of other such results that show that okay, for this type of problem, a simple problem, using the heuristic gives almost as good results as using the exact solution. Um, the heuristic has the advantage for our purpose as engineers that it also gives the possibility to, to, to kind of incorporate operational constraints or, or, or for example, as I said, you know, we might, the operator might say, yeah, it's not practical for me to, to, to do inspections at random points in time. I, I want to have a fixed schedule of inspections. That's taken care of here because we fix it at every five years we have to do these regular inspection intervals. So, there is a benefit also from the from the practical point of view in using these heuristics, and because if the optimum is so flat and we get almost the same solution, then there's no, in my point of view, not too much benefit in using the POMDP. Now that does not necessarily, or we cannot translate that from, to to the, to the to the general case. No? So it doesn't mean that this is always like that. No? There can be for sure cases where simple heuristics fail. No? So, and I'll come to that. Uh, yeah, so. so, this is called direct policy search in, in the general literature, which means that, so the policy, what is a policy? And since Sebastian already explained that the very first day, but I think he used different terms. So, and these terms are mostly what they use in this re in computer science, uh, electrical engineering communities. So, uh, the, and also the influence diagram community. The policy basically is a decision rule in Sebastian's terms. So it says that at the decision here is not, so the decisions that come here are not free. I mean free in the sense they are not, uh, you cannot decide whatever you want. You are bound by your decision rule. The decision rule says, for example, here the decision rule before would be whenever whenever um, the probability of failure is above so much, I do an, ins an inspection. That's a decision rule. In the POMDP, we are completely free. We can, based on whatever we know now, we decide what we want to do. That's completely free. Here, we limit that by, by prescribing certain decision rules that, in, in principle, re re represent a, a subset of the possible solution space. Therefore, they are not optimal, or they are not in general optimal solutions. But they make our problem much, much simpler. So this is the policy, and the strategy is just a set of, 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 of policies. So here, the policy is the same for every time step. But in principle, I could also say, as I go towards the end of the service life, I might accept a higher probability of failures because if I'm in the last year of service, even if the probability of failure is a bit higher, it doesn't make much sense to inspect. Because if next year I'm going to anyway take that structure out of service, whatever. I might just hope that it will not fail in the last year. So possible to have different policies in different years. The trick is just to, to make such that the policies can be described by a, f by a limited set of parameters. The threshold, the time of, of inspections, and, and, and then you do an optimization over those. Yes, of course. They will send people to inspect also for the support structures. To so again, whenever? They have problem with the turbine. Yes. They will send also people on the board to check also for the tower. So okay, so op opportunistic or optimistic? They call it opportunistic. Opportunistic, yes. Yeah. So if that happens, then if POMDP or any method that can find a kind of 
separate schedule for each single choice to inspect. Then you have a list, and then you can send people directly to the to the location that need to inspect for the tower for for the support structure. Then it would be uh, suitable for the practice for the practice of the. Yes, yes. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. Or, I mean, it's probably possible to model that as a POMD, PMDP, but it might be a bit uh, challenging I, to do I, I that. Mean, but you said using the heuristic approach, yes. you need to fix the interval. Or no, no, you don't need to fix the interval. interval. You can come up, you can come up with any rules that you like. No? So, and I will show example that, that this is just so these are just examples of, of rules that you can implement. No? You can implement completely different rules. You can implement, to say, a rule that says whenever the sun shines, I'm going to inspect. No? That's okay. That's also a rule that you can implement. So the, the, the only point is that instead of letting the decision completely open, I'm, I'm, I'm parametrizing, in a way, the decision. And I'm saying, OK, I, and, and, and it's based, ideally based on observations that I have. Okay. For example, the, the interesting thing is that this, this, whole, this heuristic is not based on any information that I have, actually. This is based on information. So when, when uh, this, because this probably the failure depends on what I have observed previously. So that actually takes into account observation. This heuristic doesn't even account, take into account any information because it just says a priori every five years inspect whatever is the outcome of, of what you have seen previously. You know? Now, but in your case, you can say, okay, yes, whenever there is a problem with the whenever there is a problem with the um, with, with the upper part with the actual turbine, you you do an inspection of the. That's exactly a, that's a, a, a possible policy or strategy. You know? And you can you then have to model also the, 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 the failure rate of the, the, the wind turbine itself huh? when you optimize when you check whether that's optimal or not. But you can directly implement that in in, in, in this uh, in this framework here because this is a simple heuristic. It is a very simple heuristic that you mentioned. So the heuristic is whenever there is a problem with the with the wind turbine up the upper part, you do you go and you do inspect the support structure. And then the question is, of course, how do you select the joints? No, then you have to add additional heuristics to to select joints, and, and, and that's something we are working on. But this actually shows that you know often you have actually constraints or, or other not constraints or, or engineering considerations that that prescribe already what you should do to some degree. So you don't want to be completely free, and you don't want an algorithm that tells you you should inspect in year 7.5, and then you should inspect again in year 9, because that's not practical. The practical thing is to go and inspect whatever you have to go anyway, because the ship is expensive, and, and that's what is expensive, or the transport. So you go anyway at those points in time. And that's, a, that's, a, that, that's it's already a heuristic, and you could actually directly run this approach. Other comments or questions? Yes. On the yes, yes. If, uh, instead of using this PomDB, and yes. then you like, limit it to the Markovian property, what if you build a dynamic based network? Is it possible to, to do something about the decision? I mean, you could build a inference diagram, but then there is this problem that all the decisions will influence yeah. the future. Yeah. Then, so I, I was just wondering yes, no, I mean, there's nothing. I mean, basically, the, 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 the dynamic Bayesian the network, if you have this Markovian property of the dynamic Bayesian network, will just give you, will just result in, the, in a POMDP in the end. Yeah. Yes, so you result in a POMDP, and the, the most effective solution for, for POMDP are the POMDP solutions. So there is not a more effective solution for, for the influence not diagram. Markovian? Well, you can always make a Markovian. By the, the type of trick that I that I showed you, but of course you you increase your your state space, so you you pay for that. And uh, you, yes, there's a question whether that's actually feasible or not. But uh, that's the only way I see to to. I mean, or well, I said this is an alternative. But but in, in terms of solving the inference diagram in, in an exact manner, it's actually the pump P is the is the way to go. I mean, there's this, as I said here, there's also this thing called uh, this limit, which is limited influence, limited memory influence diagrams. So there are other, but yeah, they're similar. I mean, it's not the, I wouldn't say that there's this, the solution. 
Okay, so this is, uh, this is how it works, but <laughs> as you see, I was not able to write it down for you. I, I made actually, this was, I developed this in a, on the whiteboard, but there's no whiteboard here, so I just copied the, the, it from the last time I made it. Um, let me show you, an ex let, me, let me not show it to you here. <coughs> There are two papers, one is published and one is, uh, the, the, the one that describes it nicely will be published, hopefully, at some point. Um, I mean, these things have been used a lot of times, as I said. I mean, this is not new. So these ideas of, of using this, this, this heuristics is not a new thing, but it has not actually been analyzed in, in a kind of more, 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 more general sense. Right? That's what we try to do here, and in particular in the second paper. But I'm going to show you from another presentation that I have here, uh, just a little bit how we use that in a more complex problem, because that's, the, uh, that's the ultimately what we want to do. We want to solve more complicated type of problems. Um, I'm showing you this. This is from uh, PhD. Well, from work of um, Jesus Luque. So his slides are from Jesus Luque. So basically, we have a type of problem that we start with, a, we, we, we model this as a DBN, a dynamic equation network. And since you know that now, and it's exactly this framework that I showed you before, this is very generic here. But the idea is that we do have time invariant parameters, time variant parameters, and the iteration function. So we have a large number of parameters that describe our problem. But that's still a component, so that will not be a big problem. But then we have possible inspections here. But then we have a system problem. So we are not interested only in, in a single component, but we're actually interested in the, in the structure as a whole. Right? So think of it, if you just want to have an, have an example, the two type of structures that we consider that the work here is the, le is the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So left-hand side, maybe you know this is a very idealized structural system. And the, the left hand side and the right hand side is a type of offshore structures, or you mentioned and so offshore support. There's a support structure where you might have a fatigue problems. So, I mean, this is not a fatigue. This is not for wind turbines, as you might realize. No? So this is an oil and gas platform. But um, yeah, you have uh, all these joints, and, and, and you know, this, the question is not only when do you go and inspect, but if, if this is fixed, like in your case, where do you go and, and, and should you inspect this joint, this joint, this joint, or that joint, that joint, that joint? Maybe you have to send uh, divers, which is very expensive, or even if you have, a, um, nowadays, you have probably unmanned uh, uh, vehicle uh, robots that go down there, but still very expensive to do. So you want to really optimize where you go and check. Um, so just saying that every time the property of failure of the system is above uh, 10 to the minus 4, it's not going to be sufficient because you still don't know where you should go and inspect. Hmm. So, the, so in principle, if we, we could, I mean, this, we could have this enormous uh, decision tree, which doesn't work. We can try to make an influence diagram. Oh, we, we make an influence diagram. It already becomes also a bit sketchy here. Eh? So the idea is that okay, we have these different components. We have the different components, and maybe there are 50 components or 100 components, so a, a series of these. We make a simple model here in terms of dependence. So what we assume is that the dependence between the different, there's dependence between different param, uh, components. So if the fatigue uh, is, is larger than expected in component one, then it's also larger, or not, it's also likely that it might be larger in other components. And the same happens with material parameters. So we consider that by introducing this hierarchical model here that says there is some kind of common factors. So simplified model to represent dependence. But that's basically also represents more or less the information we have. We could make a more sophisticated model, but we don't actually know what are the dependencies. So there is dependence between components here, and then each component has a certain performance, fatigue, no fatigue, or, or corrosion. And so on. Then that translates into a con component state the component can be, in, in this case, either, either working or not working. And that then translates into a system state. You know? The system is failing or not. And here also enters, actually, the, the environmental load, which is not shown here, but 
we have also the environmental loads that then decide whether the structure fails in that year or not. And that is, of course, what we want to avoid. This is the actual ultimate failure. And so this is a huge, and then now we have uh, many decisions. So each component can, in principle, be inspected in every year. And yeah, this would not be possible to solve. Even with, I mean, we spoke with Costas and other people, but I mean, in Pompey P, you could not solve these large size problems. Unless we make some, some assumptions that are not realistic, are really not realistic. So that doesn't work. Anyway, this, okay, this is the model. I'm not going to explain this. So this is the thing we want to do. And um, now we need is, is uh, heuristics. Because we're going to use this heuristics approach. And the heuristics we're using is uh, in this example. But of course, you can use different heuristics. No? So you could say, OK, we go, we go and inspect whenever the, the the turbine is having problems. Here we say we inspect campaigns, we perform campaigns at regular intervals, every five years, every year. That's a parameter. Then we fix the number of components that are inspected in each campaign. Again, that might not be optimal. You might have that at the beginning you want to inspect more and later you want to inspect less. We fix it at each thing. Then the third one is how do we select, let's say we inspect 10 components in each campaign, how do we select those components? Now we say, OK, we, we, we try to pick those components that give the highest value of information for, for, um, uh, sorry, that give the highest value of information by considering what do I learn about this component and about all the other components. That, in principle, would mean I have to make a value of information analysis within the value of information analysis. So that would be obviously complex. Too, uh, doesn't work. So instead, we are using a proxy. I'm going to say what that is. Then we also add this thing because we say, okay, there might be the case where, where we, we end up having a too high probability of failure. And so we add an additional threshold and say that for safety reasons, if that threshold is exceeded, we have to do an additional campaign. It can turn out that the, 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 the outcomes are, are terrible, and this might lead to additional campaign. Um, and finally, repairs are carried out whenever we exceed some repair criterion. So we have, in the end, five, or okay, one, two, three, four, and here also there's one or parameter or that we have to pick. So there are five parameters that are optimization parameters, but once I fix those five parameters, uh, for a given Type of, for, for a given state of knowledge, at every point in time, it's exactly determined what inspections I have to perform and what repairs. So I take all the decisions out. And I, I decision, so once I fix those five parameters, the decisions are made. And I can just simulate with the, the easiest thing would be to use Monte Carlo simulation. So we just simulate with the Monte Carlo simulation the history of the structure. And I'm going to explain why that's not exactly optimal. but. Uh, we just think of Monte Carlo simulation and we, we simulate the whole history and that's at least feasible. Unless I have a, I have a very expensive finite element model. So that would be the, the, the thing. And Now how do I, what is, the, what is the proxy? So how do I select the components? Well, if you, the first, start, the first structure we look at is this structure here. This is this Daniels, not because of me, but the Daniels system that was studied by Daniels um, long before my time. And it's a very simple structural system that is used often to, to study the effect of, of, of redundancy. So the assumption is that I have n identical but independent components. And so they are not, they are not distinguishable. And the, the load is carried by all of them together. And then they can have, we can have a brittle or, or ductile uh, failure, mo failure material behavior. But the point is, here, we, um, or in, in, in the model that we have, we say, OK, this can be subject to deterioration. Or they are subject to deterioration. Now we should inspect. Now, in the first inspection, of course, it doesn't matter which one we inspect, because because uh, they're all the same. 
So if we fix and say we inspect 10 components, we can pick randomly 10 components because there's no difference in them. In this is a simple example. Then I go to the more complicated one afterwards. But then in the second, in the second uh, round, the second inspection campaign, we have already inspected some components, so they are now not the same anymore. So at that point, we have to decide which components to inspect. And now we said, okay, we should pick those components that have the highest, that provide the highest value of information with respect to the total, um, to the total system. Well, now, what we can kind of see, or one can kind of show approximately, not show exactly, but in an exact sense, but, but in an approximate sense, is that the, the, I can, the, how much I can learn is a function of what is the probability of having deterioration in that particular component. And I did some studies like this already in my thesis, so that it's also there you can find some more information. So, 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 so ultimately we can use the probability of, of the component being in, in a damaged state as a proxy for the value of information. The higher the probability of that component to be in a damaged state, the more we can learn from inspecting that component. So that is the proxy we use here. We just say whatever the probability of failure of the component, we pick the ones that have the highest probability of failure of components and those we inspect. Because those are actually the ones that we also learn most about. Yeah? more related to the uncertainty of the state so we can learn more yes. we, can, yes. we, can, we can learn more in principle when there, when there is higher uncertainty yes but in this case it turns out that when the high that's exactly the point yeah, is that exactly. the, we have the, the higher uncertainty means actually there's a higher probability of failure unless the probability of failure is close to one in which case we are at the other side but that doesn't happen here yes so now when we go to the other structure here or here it's not like this because the components are actually different so there is not First of all, they have different, I mean, they have different functionalities. So we can't just use the, only use the probability of failure because they are structures, they have also different functionalities. So additionally, we consider in this as a heuristic here, we consider not only the probability of failure, but also the importance of the component for the structure. So we say that, okay, one thing is that we want to learn most about the structure as a whole, and that is the components that have the highest probability of failure give us the most information. But then, it would be ridiculous if, this, if the, uh, those will typically be components that have lower importance because those have a higher probability of failure or can have a higher probability of failure because they're maybe just tertiary members that don't cause a lot of damage. But the primary members are the ones that are critical. Maybe they are quite safe, so I might not learn a lot on the rest of the structure by inspecting them, but I will learn a lot about the safety of the structure. So, so, so we have to somehow combine say, okay, we should inspect those components that are important for the structure in terms of the, 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 fun, the, the, the functionality and those components that give us the most information. And then we, we, how do we do that? We have, a, we have an indicator for the redundancy of the system with respect to failure of the components. So that gives us, for example, if, what, if, the failure, if this component here fails, what is the effect on the system failure probability? And we have a measure for that. And then we have the component failure probability, the actual failure probability. And we have these two things. And, and then we, give, we, have a, we have one parameter that, that basically gives higher weight to one, to one or the other. So we, we say, OK, we have to weigh these two, these two attributes. And the way we give is something we don't know. Maybe it's more important to actually, to actually uh, inspect important components, or it might be more important to inspect components that have a lower, that, that, have, that provide us more information. And then we just let this parameter be an optimization parameter. So this is a, just a proxy for the value of information. Um, but it gives, a, it gives a reasonable heuristic, we believe. Anyway, but you can come up with any other, I mean, there's a lot of freedom here. You can come up with different heuristics how to pick components in the system. Um, let me implement this, and I'm going to go into the details here. Okay, now, okay, yeah, this is not the latest, so this is, was, was a few years ago, um, and uh, so we have some, we have some changes in, 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 so that's why I showed you before that this was on the whiteboard, um, but this still gives the idea of, of what's going on. 
Um, so first of all, we have to talk. So now we, we, what we want to do is we want to calculate now for a given, first for a given strategy, so for a given heuristic with fixed values of the parameters, we want to compute the total expected cost, the lifetime cost of the structure. So this is a, as I said, you could just run straightforward Monte Carlo analysis. And essentially that's what it says here is S is the strategy, so S we fix. And then initially we also fix set. Set are the inspection outcomes. But the dimension, this is a bit too tricky because the dimension of that depends on, on the decisions you make. So it's, it's not a fixed dimension that has, it's large and it has in varying dimensions. But we just simulate some, we simulate first some inspection outcomes and we, we simulate, uh, or we have fixed our strategy. So whenever, the, the, every five years we inspect, every inspection campaign has 10 inspections and so on. And then we can run the, now we can just run the dynamic Bayesian network with that here. So we, we, we run actually the algorithm that we have to solve the dynamic Bayesian network using discrete exact inference. And that gives us the probability of failure at each point in time of the system, conditional on, on what we have observed and conditional on what we do. And then we multiply that with the probability of, well, the discounted, there's a discount rate here, of course, so the discounted uh, cost of failure, sum up, and we get the, there's a little thing here behind that I don't want to explain now, but we sum up the, the, the risk. So this is the risk. And then we have the cost of repair, so that how many repairs do we have to do, and how many inspections we have to do, and that is also determined relatively straightforwardly by this, the strategy and the outcomes. So that's okay. Now, however, this is always assuming that I know already the outcome of the inspections, which I don't. So I have to do an additional integration. And as I said, that is very, very high dimensional, even, and is varying dimensional. So that's a bit tricky to do. So for this, we use Monte Carlo simulation. And now, as I said, I said before, Monte Carlo simulation is not very effective. But the good thing is, in this, in at least with this approach here, we have calculated the probability of failure already here with the Bayesian network. So here, and we have calculated the risk. So here, we are not dealing with the small probability events. They are, cal they are already taken care of here. Those are just the costs. And to get, you know, if you know Monte Carlo, so if you just want to calculate the mean value of something that is not a, a small probability, but it's just a relatively robust number, you, uh, 200 or 100 simulations are enough. If you want to, to simulate and include, simulate over the failure events, because those are the higher probability of failure of 10 to the minus 5 or so, you would need millions of samples. But here we just need 100 or 200 samples to do the Monte Carlo. But you could also direct, you could also forget about the Bayesian network and directly simulate everything straightforwardly, and then you have to reduce much more samples, but it's also a possibility. Still, compared to this, you know, in almost, I mean, the exponential increase in, 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 in the direct solution is even in one million samples is nothing. So, okay. And then we find the optimum by, by doing an optimization over that. Now, this is a stochastic optimization because the, the objective function itself is computed with Monte Carlo. So, you have noise in your objective function. So, we typically use some kind of stochastic optimization here, like a cross entropy or something like that. But that's. It's, uh, okay, and then this is just. Okay, this was from Jesus, but this is actually a bit old. So, but anyway. Um, so how does that work? So, so basically, the idea is, okay, as I said, first you, you simulate those inspection results. Um, and so this is uh, one simulation of, a, of the time, and for this the Bayesian network is used here. Yeah? You use the Bayesian network to calculate for a given realization of, 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 of observations. And, and so here is the first inspection campaign. Obviously, uh, every 10 years there is an inspection campaign here. But then we exceed here the threshold. This is the threshold that we have put. Then you have to have an additional campaign. And it turns out that we do a, we, we do a first inspection, and the, the inspection result is actually not that good. So the, the, the probability goes 
And for a component, that doesn't happen because for a component, whenever the inspection result is bad, we fix it. But for a system, this doesn't work because let's say I find some defects in the system, I can fix those defects, but that still might increase my failure probability for the system as a whole because the other components are also in a bad shape, likely. So what happened here is okay, there were some kind of bad results, so there was a need for additional inspections that's done here in C and D, and then it continues. And then again, here is an additional campaign needed. Uh, then there's a campaign here, and so on. This is for, and then these are the these are the reliability of the individual components. So for each component, you get also the, the the probability of failure. So you see, some components have high probabilities, and other components have low probabilities, and then those are inspected, and, and so on. Um, and then you get the costs. You see, these are the costs for this example here. The costs over time, where these are the failure costs. Or the, the, the risks, actually, the expected failure costs. So they are, in this case, they are low. Low risks are low. And then here are the, the inspection campaigns where you have a mobilization cost that is high. You have, a, but it goes down a little bit because of this counting. Uh, you have a, the cost of inspecting each individual component. That is the number of the function of the number of components inspected. And you have a repair cost. So. And then you sum up those costs, and you get uh, the cost for a strategy. Yeah. And these are, we simulate two or 300 uh, histories like this. These are the system failure probabilities associated with those two or 300 histories. And that gives us then the average. So the, basically, this, this is for one history. We get these costs. And then we do repeat that for 100 histories or, or, or thousands. And we take the average of those costs, and that looks then, when we sum them up, and then we see that it looks like this. For example, here, with this very simple example of this uh, Daniel system, let's just check okay, how many numbers of components to inspect per campaign. Turns out that here the optimal number is three. If we do five years interval, but if we do 10 years interval, which gives lower costs overall, so that's what we should do, we should inspect maybe between uh, four, five, six. See that actually, and you see that there is, a, you know, because of the Monte Carlos uh, that we do, that it's not, you know, we, we expect that to be smooth. You know, so, but there is a Monte Carlo error here. Um, but yeah, somewhere in this. So you should do more, I see, oh, not, that, not surprisingly, you should to inspect more components if you inspect less frequently. And so on. And yeah, you can go on and on and on and on. Like so. Now, the point is that this. This strategy does not guarantee, or it, well, actually, it does not give you the optimal strategy. Because you don't consider everything possible. I mean, and if you look at these histories, you can, that quickly, you can identify that some of these things are pretty stupid. Like you, you inspect uh, two years in a row, that doesn't make sense. So these policies that we prescribe are not optimal. But the thing is, we can calculate, it allows us to actually calculate the expected cost of the strategy. And you can always come up with another strategy, compare it, and then take another one that is better. So since we have, it's not possible to get an exact solution for this problem, so we have no reference solution. We cannot say like, that this is how this works, or it doesn't work, or how good it works. Well, the only thing we can say is that we have a way of, identi of, 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 of actually checking whether a particular strategy gives us what it gives us in terms of expected cost. And we can compare it to any other strategy that we might come up with, that you might come up with. Um, and we just pick the one that gives the best results. But the fact that, they, that, that the fact that there's no reference solution is exactly the thing, is that there is not possible to get an exact solution, at least at the moment, for this type of more complex problems. For a simple problem, we could compare it. And we saw that it uh, gives similar results no? but, than the exact one. But here, we don't know. But we know that what we calculate here, and what we calculate here is, um, is uh, the actual expected cost plus minus some Monte Carlo error. All right. Yes, yes, just ask questions, please. Just a small question. Uh, how, how do you calculate the failure of the system condition of 
I look at the, 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 that's a good question. So, but basically, I mean, okay, they are different approaches. Uh, the, the, the probability of the failure of the system given failure from component, uh, I mean, in these examples that we have here, we have only in the order of 20 components. And I mean, there's more, compo there's, more there's more components, but then we can reduce, for example, if you have, let's say you have uh, three wells that are within the same element, you don't have to do free analysis because the, the, you know that the failure of one weld is, is equivalent to the failure of another weld, so we can reduce the number of, of actual elements that we have to take out of the system. So we are on the order of less than 20. So what we do is we just take all the possible combinations of, of, of failures and we run um, a structural analysis for this. No? These are simple pushover analysis, I mean simple non-linear pushover analysis that you have to do. Um, and then we do an I mean we use a simple reliability approximation. The problem is actually, the, the real problem is that it's not sufficient to consider only the f what is the effect of the failure of one component. Because if that's the case, we just have to take out that kind of component, we run a reliability analysis, and we do that for each component. We have to do 100 reliability analysis. That would not be a big problem. I mean, nowadays. The real problem is that we actually have to consider to be correct, um, and that you can make, I sh this is something I investigated, you can make a big mistake if you think that the effect of the component is related only to, to removing that particular component. Often you might have two or three components that work together and maybe taking out one is not critical, but taking out two of those is completely disastrous. No? So you have to actually consider all possible, in principle, all possible combinations of failures of elements and that gives you, if you have 20, it's still okay because 20 to the power, two to the power of 20 is around one million. But if you have 40 elements, you end up with one trillion combinations that again is not already feasible. So, we, so here we just reduce the number of components so that we can actually deal with, with this. Otherwise you have to, there's approaches uh, by uh, Jun Ho Song and others that have, that, that, that can be implemented, that can be used here to get an, to get an estimate of, of what is the system failure probability conditional on component failures. Uh, that's an, a problem in itself. Yes if you have larger systems. Um, okay, so, well, that, I think I go back to my main presentation, but that is also more or less, I think, the end of it, because oh, I still had to, I promised to look at, or as I said, that we look at one more example, but I know that it's time for coffee break, so I will, um, I will uh, more or less end here. As I said, here, this is more or less what, what I explained. Uh, we have just changed a bit. And uh, we, have, we have corrected some errors and, and changed a bit the notation. But um, yes, so this is described here. And, and, and I mean, this is, an, this is an idea that's not, again, this, you, can, you can find this in computer science. So this direct policy search is something that people in computer science or other fields have actually been using um, in, least in recent years. Um, but of course the heuristics that we have to come up with are really specific for, for our problems. No, we can't take them over from, from computer science. So that's something that we describe here. Okay. Good. Questions or comments or more? Coffee break? All right, so we have the coffee break, and after the coffee break, we have uh, presentations. How many are there? Four. Four. So we have four presentations by some of you on specific uh, things that you're dealing with. Let's see if we manage before the, for the lunch, otherwise we do it, we continue after the lunch. Maybe.